Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. For those who don't know, my name is Daniel Horan, and I'm Professor of Philosophy, Religious Studies, and Theology here at St. Mary's College, where I have the distinct privilege of serving as the Director of the Center for the Study of Spirituality. I am delighted to welcome you this evening to our event. Before introducing our guest, I'd like to say a little bit about the Center for the Study of Spirituality. Founded in 1984, that's right, we're coming up on our 40th birthday. The center's turning middle age, I guess you could say. <laughs> Founded in 1984 by Dr. Keith Egan, with support from the Sisters of the Holy Cross, the Center for the Study of Spirituality offers programs that promote the engagement between faith and reason and the connection between mind, body, and spirit. As an academic center, it is a hub for scholarly and public engagement, which draws on intellectual resources in the Catholic and broader Christian tradition as well as how individuals practice faith in their daily lives to develop critical conversations around contemporary religious issues, especially as they relate to women's experiences in society, the academy, and the church. Before we proceed with our event, we wish to acknowledge that we are gathering on sacred land and to honor the native peoples who have been the traditional custodians of this place for generations. We particularly recognize the Pokagon Band of the, of the Potawatomi and the Miami, who have cared for this land and its resources for many generations and continue to do so today. It's with deep gratitude that we recognize our native siblings and their cultures within our community, as well as acknowledging the land upon which we gather, pray, learn, and work. The format for our program this afternoon is threefold. First, Dr. Steidel Jack will offer a brief presentation about his work. Next, Dr. Steidel Jack and I will engage in a conversation about his book. And finally, we will open the floor for questions and comments from our audience. This is also a good time to remind those in attendance that academic events and lectures such as this one are not debates, but are educational opportunities at which local and national experts um, speak on topics related to their expertise and their research. As a Catholic university, St. Mary's College is committed to academic freedom, to exploration of a range of scholarly topics, and respectful engagement. Additionally, this evening, the Center for Faith, Action, and Ministry will be hosting a gathering for St. Mary's students wishing to continue the discussion that begins tonight and to process further. You are invited to join some of the CFAM staff immediately following this event down the hall in Mataliva Room 211. Please stop by to debrief, to ask questions with the CFAM staff, as well as peers in a welcoming environment, and most importantly, to enjoy some sweet, sweet desserts. Finally, I've also been asked to remind those gathered, as in all of our events, that anyone who engages in disruptive or disrespectful behavior will be asked to leave. I know that won't be a problem for us. Now it is my privilege to introduce our guest today. Dr. Jason Steidel Jack is a gay Catholic theologian and assistant teaching professor of religious studies at St. Joseph's University in New York. He earned his undergraduate degree from Georgetown University, a master's degree from some place called the University of Notre Dame, and his PhD from Fordham University. His research, ministry, and advocacy focus on the movement for LGBTQ pastoral care and affirmation in the Roman Catholic Church. A member of the group Out at St. Paul, the LGBTQ Catholic Ministry of St. Paul the Apostle Church in Manhattan. He has also served as a board member and theological advisor for Fortunate Families. It's a national apostolate and ministry that advocates for LGBTQ Catholics and their families. His writing has appeared in popular publications such as Commonweal Magazine, The National Catholic Reporter, and Outreach, a ministry of America Media along with academic journals such as Worship and U.S. Catholic Historian. His first book, titled LGBTQ Catholic Ministry, Past and Present, was published by Paulus Press last year, and it is the subject of our event today. He lives in Brooklyn with his husband, Damien. Please join me in extending a warm St. Mary's College welcome to Dr. Jason Steidel Jack. Thank you all so much. It's a gift. It's a pleasure to be with you today. 
I'm excited. I'm going to share with you a little bit from my book, from the introduction, to give you a taste of what my research is about uh, and a little bit more of insight into, yeah, what this book uh, speaks on. Introduction, no such thing as an LGBTQ Catholic. In 2018, Charles Chaput, then Archbishop of Philadelphia, surprised many when he told the Synod on Youth, there is no such thing as an LGBTQ Catholic. Using the acronym and official church teaching, he suggested, would imply, quote, that these are real autonomous groups, and the church simply doesn't categorize people that way, end quote. His claim would be laughable were it not such a brazen attempt to erase LGBTQ Catholics. If there is no such thing as an LGBTQ Catholic, after all, their objections to homophobia and transphobia can go unanswered. If there is no such thing as an LGBTQ Catholic, there is no need to show them compassion. Chapu must know that the church's teaching does, in fact, categorize people by their sexuality. The catechism labels same-sex desire as a condition and homosexual acts as intrinsically disordered. The Vatican bans men from sem seminary if they, quote, practice homosexuality, present deep-seated homosexual tendencies, or support the so-called gay culture, end quote. Chapu, along with other bishops, endorses Courage, a ministry for those who, quote, experience same-sex attractions and those who love them, end quote. These are real categories with real consequences. For many Catholic leaders, only certain groups categorized by their sexuality can be acknowledged. Those who are ashamed of their intrinsic disorder and struggle against their homosexual inclinations. The hierarchy's anti-queer rhetoric adds to the church's long history of institutional erasure, manipulation, and spiritual abuse of LGBTQ people. But this is not the only side of the story. For many decades, LGBTQ Catholics and allies have asserted their place within a religious institution that often denies their existence. They have done so by creating ministries of hospitality and affirmation that reflect their unique spiritualities and traditions. Due to social and ecclesial homophobia and transphobia, they also present unique, uh, unique pastoral needs. Today, the LGBTQ Catholic movement is gaining momentum. Grassroots attitudes are shifting and ministries are flourishing. The Pope himself seems to be on board with many, with many initiatives. It may be a time for cautious optimism, but we must also remember the painful past. LGBTQ apostolates are precarious and they face opposition from authorities at local, diocesan, and universal levels of the church. As long as leaders like Charles Chaput try to erase LGBTQ Catholics, it is all the more necessary to share their stories of perseverance. The story of this book, my book, begins with the Society of Jesus. In February 2017, a group of Jesuits moved near my parish, the Church of St. Paul the Apostle in Manhattan. Shortly after they arrived, the Out at St. Paul, or OSP, ministry team, which I was then a part of, received an unsolicited email from Father James Martin. He wanted to speak with us about building a bridge, the new book he had written in response to the Pulse nightclub shooting. At first, we questioned Father Martin's intentions. Who was he and why did he deserve our time? As proud New Yorkers, we were curious, but not starstruck. Our ministry was already successful. We had our own voice, our community, and our heroes. We didn't want to be used as a promotional opportunity. Despite our misgivings, we gave Father Martin a chance. He was a superstar priest and had a great deal of influence after all. At his first talk with our community, we were floored by the dozens of visitors who came to hear him speak. So many longed to hear a priest say that they were created in God's image and deeply loved. Over the next few months, we watched as building a bridge exploded in popularity. Martin's speaking events and media appearances made it clear that he had tapped into a powerful spiritual and cultural moment. We were amazed at the shockwaves that his simple message sent throughout the church. The advocacy that out at St. Paul's took for granted was dangerously charged for many committed to maintaining the status quo. At times, his allyship came with a heavy cost, vicious personal attacks, threats, and attempts at manipulation from the highest levels of the church. 
The controversy surrounding building a bridge continues to this day, but so has the advocacy it inspires. Family and friends of LGBTQ people ask how they can make the church more hospitable. Lay folks show up in droves to support parishes with affirming ministries. Priests, often risking their own careers, create spaces for LGBTQ parishioners to serve as CCD leaders, Eucharistic ministers, and members of the choir. Even some bishops are building better relationships with the LGBTQ Catholic community. There are reasons for optimism. There is also much work that remains to be done. Since Building a Bridge was published, I've spoken with countless Catholics who are passionate about LGBTQ ministry, but feel stymied by a lack of resources. Father Martin's book is a helpful conversation starter, but what does community and pastoral care look like in the real world? How do ministers navigate the complexities of church teaching and institutions? Unfortunately, in a church that sees queer sexuality and gender as a source of shame, LGBTQ ministry is often discussed in hushed tones and coded language. What if an unfriendly priest hears? Uh, should we fear reprisal from alt-right Catholic websites such as Church Militant, which was still functioning when I wrote this? What will the bishop say? The news is full of stories about LGBTQ and allied Catholics fired from their jobs in schools and parishes for coming across as too friendly to the movement. Unlike many, I've had the privilege of belonging to an affirming parish where it's safe to be openly gay and minister. I've also served on the board of directors for Fortunate Families, a national ministry dedicated to equipping the church for the pastoral care of LGBTQ people. More importantly, my experiences as a gay Catholic and theologian shape how I understand the church's relationship to the LGBTQ community. Sometimes the history of this relationship is hard to recount. The church's mistreatment of queer Catholics is heartbreaking. Nevertheless, a painful history opens up to hope for the future. LGBTQ Catholics and their allies are tenacious. Decades of ministry provide a vision for what is possible in communities committed to justice and mercy. This book shares some of their experiences. I offer this work with three audiences in mind. First, I write for LGBTQ Catholics. Most of us were raised in homes and parishes that taught us we were strange and did not belong. Homophobia and transphobia perpetuated our isolation and shame. There were few, if any, queer mentors, role models, or saints. It took many of us years to integrate our faith and sexuality and find our place within the broader LGBTQ community. Once we arrived, however, we discovered a people ennobled and emboldened by generations of struggle. We found ourselves surrounded and supported by a great cloud of witnesses, those saints, canonized or not, who lived with integrity and helped others to do the same. Queer believers belong to a proud movement that is making the church more Christ-like. My book affirms that we are not and have never been alone. Second, I write for allies and ministers. The church can be terrifying for advocates of queer people. LGBTQ ministry is dangerous, and many have greatly suffered for their solidarity with the queer community. Is it worth it? When will change come? You're not the first to ask these questions, and you won't be the last. Your efforts, nevertheless, matter a great deal. You help LGBTQ Catholics hold on to their faith. The burdens you take upon yourself make their burdens more bearable. Your solidarity and allyship are invaluable, and I write with examples of perseverance to encourage you to press on. Third, I write for an academic audience. I'm a liberation theologian by training. My approach employs history in the service of theology, defined by Gustavo Gutierrez as a critical reflection on Christian praxis in light of the word of God. Especially important to liberationist thought is the experience of the poor and marginalized as a locus theologicus, a fruitful space to reflect on God's work in the world. This book explores LGBTQ experience as one such site. My book is also a work of pastoral theology. In recent decades, the discipline has exploded with subfields dedicated to families, women, children, youth, racial and ethnic communities, and other groups. Ministry to LGBTQ people is a new but rapidly expanding area of interest within this milieu. 
More often than not, however, the conversation is about LGBTQ people rather than with them. I offer a history that prioritizes LGBTQ perspectives to encourage dialogue and greater understanding. My book is divided into eight chapters. The first chapter examines the origins of LGBTQ Catholic ministry in the Eucharistic Catholic Church, an independent Catholic community founded by George Hyde, an ex-seminarian from Atlanta in 1946. Throughout the mid to 20th century, the Eucharistic Catholic Church grew into an international organization committed to caring for its socially ostracized members. The de denomination was part of the homophile movement, which encouraged gays and lesbians to integrate into mainstream society as best they could. As a church of gay and straight and black and white parishioners, the Eucharistic Catholic Church established a powerful precedent for diverse and affirming ministry. The second chapter traces the meteoric rise of Dignity USA, an influential ministry founded in 1969 by an Augustinian priest from San Diego. At times, Dignity succeeded in winning the support of lay Catholics, priests, and even bishops. The group's unapologetically LGBTQ-affirming theology, however, set it on a crash course with the Vatican, which in 1986 expelled Dignity and similar groups from Catholic parishes around the world. Today, the community is a prophetic force that lobbies for change outside of traditional parish and diocesan structures. The model of ministry that Dignity USA established decades ago remains a powerful example of LGBTQ affirming communities today. Chapter three recounts the history of New Ways Ministry, a national organization that has navigated ministry at the edges of the institutional church. Launched in 1977 by Sister Janine Gramick and Father Robert Nugent, New Ways Ministry today is well known for workshops, retreats, newsletters, and book publishing. Opposition from the hierarchy has been severe over the course of more than half a century, but New Ways Ministry has survived by blurring the line between outsider and insider status. Today, many of its leaders are lay people, and it continues to be one of the most influential voices on LGBTQ Catholic issues. Chapter four tells the story of fortunate families which emerged in the 2000s as a ministry by and for allied parents struggling to accept their children's sexuality. In addition to providing pastoral support for families, founders Casey and Mary Ellen Lopada harnessed parents' love for their children in the struggle for LGBTQ liberation. In recent years, Fortunate Families has pursued a more reconciling relationship with the institutional church by obtaining the blessing of Bishop John Stowe, the Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky, where Fortunate Families National Headquarters are located. The bishop's endorsement has enabled the group, now led by J.R. Zerkowski, to serve within parishes, dioceses, schools, and religious orders across the United States. Chapters five and six turn to the LGBTQ community of St. Paul the Apostle, my urban parish in New York City that is also the mother church of the Paulist Fathers, a missionary order committed to evangelizing U.S. culture. The original gay and lesbian ministry at St. Paul began in the early 1990s at the height of the AIDS epidemic, a time when gay activists were locked in conflict with the Archdiocese of New York. Donald Mayer, a gay activist and member of St. Paul, created a ministry of hospitality, compassion, and affirmation to overcome the divide between gays and lesbians and the institutional church. After a brief hiatus in the early 2000s, LGBTQ ministry returned to the parish under the leadership of its pastor, Father Gil Martinez, and a ministry team of lay leaders. Today, out at St. Paul is a thriving apostolate that reflects the cultures and charisms of Hell's Kitchen, the parish's gayberhood to its south. Chapters seven and eight follow the evolution of Father James Martin's ministry with LGBTQ Catholics. A Jesuit like Pope Francis, Martin emulates Christ's outreach to social and religious outcasts, provoking praise and criticism from around the world. Although Martin does not dissent from church teaching and enjoys his superior's approval, his challenge for the institutional church to build a bridge to LGBTQ community has solicited robust responses in recent years. Today, he's one of the most recognizable allies of the LGBTQ Catholic movement. The ninth chapter concludes with observations and reflections on the present state of LGBTQ ministry. Why would anyone hope that the institutional church will change? 
Queer ecclesiology shows us a way forward. Rather than relying on the hierarchy, Catholics must look to LGBTQ people and their allies for salvation from homophobia and transphobia. At the grassroots level, Catholics are among the most affirming Christians in the United States, and apostolates are springing up in Catholic parishes around the country. The chapter concludes with short profiles of three new ministries that prove God is transforming the Catholic Church through LGBTQ and allied Catholics. Unfortunately, there are many stories and perspectives that are absent from my work. First, the geographic scope of my book is limited to the United States. The Catholic Church extends around the world with local, national, and international LGBTQ ministries that merit further study. Second, it is limited by its historical timeline. Queer Catholics have been part of the church since its founding, yet my book only examines ministries from the middle 20th to the early 21st centuries. Third, my approach privileges the stories of lay and grassroots actors and communities on the margins of the institutional church. In the future, I hope to write about the rise and fall of LGBTQ ministries and dioceses and archdioceses such as Cleveland, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Baltimore. These histories offer invaluable insights into the clerical and hierarchical cultures of a church that has wrestled with its identity since Vatican II. Fourth, while the present book at times focuses on the experiences of women, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and other marginalized and minoritized groups, their perspectives are far underrepresented, and much work remains to be done discovering, recovering, and amplifying their voices. Sexism, racism, ableism, ageism, and other structural sins dominate history telling as much as any other form of human culture. This is an area of growth for my own scholarship and academic scholarship more broadly. For LGBTQ people, coming out is a prophetic act of resistance against erasure. Harvey Milk, one of the first openly gay politicians in the United States, told activists, we will not win our rights by staying quietly in our closets. We are coming out. We are coming out to fight the lies, the myths, the distortions. We're coming out to tell the truth about gays. As a political, spiritual, and relational tool, coming out functions in the church just as well as it does in society. Queer Catholic honesty and vul vulnerability change hearts. In Catholic communities, telling the history of LGBTQ Catholics reveals that Chapu and hierarchs like him are gravely mistaken. LGBTQ Catholics exist and have been a real autonomous group for more than three quarters of a century. From a theological standpoint, LGBTQ Catholic stories are also sacred. They possess God-given power to challenge Christian homophobia and transphobia by revealing the innumerable ways that God moves outside of traditional family, relationship, and even church structures. LGBTQ people belong to the body of Christ, and they call the church to be more faithful to Christ's mission, hospitality, compassion, and accompaniment. At the start of the gay liberation movement, a popular activist refrain proclaimed, we are here, we are queer, get used to it. As LGBTQ Catholics and allies continue to struggle for recognition, affirmation, and justice, their advocacy in the church echoes their forebear's message. LGBTQ Catholic ministry is here, LGBTQ Catholic ministry is queer, and it's time for the church to get used to it. Thank you. Well, Dr. Steidel-Jack, thank you so much for uh, a wonderfully engaging presentation and an impressive summation of a 200-page book <laughs> in about 20 minutes. And so uh, we're grateful for that. And um, if you aren't already interested in purchasing the book and reading it, uh, I, I assume you will be by the time our conversation is, is complete. But to begin with, I want to say, in addition to thanking you for taking the time to be here to talk about this book, um, I want to thank you for the writing of the book itself. It's, and I don't say this about every text, but it is well-written, it's well-researched, and it is engaging. 
Um, if you're a history buff, you will love a book like this. If you're not a history buff, then sometimes historical texts can seem like a slog. You know, this date, this name, this event, this place, and you go, oh my gosh, okay. But the story that you tell is deeply engaging because it's deeply personal. It's about real people's lives, their deep, passionate commitment for their Catholic faith, um, the joys, the hopes, the griefs, and the anxieties of the people of God. I think one thing that really surprised me in the reading of the book, um, and you you hinted at this a little bit in your in your remarks, is that um, what a lot of Catholics think of as a very recent development, which is outreach and dedicated ministry to the LGBTQ community, goes back in the United States to almost a hundred years, going back to 1945. That was wonderfully surprising to me. I didn't. I learned a lot about uh, from that. I'm curious in your research, your archival work, um, all the work you did to put this book together, were there things that you found particularly surprising along the way? Uh, two things very surprising to me. First of all, that LGBTQ Catholics have stuck around. I think in spite of all the opposition, in spite of uh, all the obstacles that they've had to overcome, queer folks have been in the church and remained committed to it, changing it. In, in all different ways, right? Um, that's one thing that I've really come to appreciate as a gay Catholic who's involved in ministry and after writing this work too, is, is that there's so many different strategies for change. Um, so many different ways of relating to the institutional church, so many different ways of uh, being an ally, right? And a friend minister to the LGBTQ community. Um, I was also really surprised by just how terrible parts of the institutional church were to queer Catholics. Um, it was heartbreaking to read a Vatican documents in the 1980s that came out at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis, right? When uh, gay men especially were dying hundreds in the hundreds of thousands uh, to, to read church documents, essentially kicking LGBTQ Catholics out of their parishes, right? Saying uh, that they were taking advantage of, of gullible priests and that they were imposing ideological politics uh, onto the church, right? Um, these documents came out at a, a time when the LGBTQ community was at its most vulnerable. And it really was upsetting for me to read this history. I mean, to imagine what it would have been like to be uh, a queer Catholic at that time. Um, just story after story of, of heartbreak. So yeah, those are the two things, both the persistence, but then also the heartbreak, uh, imagining what it would have been like to, to be active at that time. You shared this actually in your remarks. Um, it appears kind of toward the end of your introduction, this, this statement that you make that, and I'm going to quote here, from a theological standpoint, LGBTQ Catholic stories are also sacred. They possess God-given power to challenge Christian homophobia and transphobia by revealing the innumerable ways that God moves outside of traditional family relationship and even church structures. While I believe that most Catholics would fully agree with you, there still are some Catholics who might have a hard time accepting that LGBTQ Catholic stories are sacred. I'm curious why you think there is this persistence of denying the sacredness and the dignity of queer people in the church. Sure. I think a lot of people are committed to a certain image of God and, and who God is and how God acts in, in people's lives. And unfortunately, that image is often limited. That image is often narrow. That, that image is often bound to particular cultures and contexts uh, that are, are stale and, and that don't reflect the reality of people's lives. Um, so the, the church's official teaching still is that homosexual desire is intrinsically disordered, right? That it is the wrong use of the bodies that God has given to human beings, the wrong use of sexual faculties, right? Um, and yet I talk to my gay friends, I'm gay myself, I'm married. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with how I understand my sexuality, how I experience my sexuality, or how I see God in my life, right? Um, God works through my marriage. And that's a good, That's a, I've become holier because I'm married to a man than I, than I would be if I weren't married to a man. Um, and so uh, I think what a lot of LGBTQ Catholics are advocating for is that we pay attention to the stories, to the experiences, um, to the perspectives of people who are on the mar margins. Um, the God of Christianity, after all, is a God who does go to the margins, who pays attention to the margins. Uh, it is the God who sees God's suffering people in Egypt and leads them out to liberation. It's the God of Jesus Christ who 
goes to the social outcasts, right? Ministers to the people who nobody else wants to be around. Um, so for me, the heart of Christianity is expecting God to show up in places where most people don't expect God to show up. Uh, and as a queer Catholic theologian, I absolutely believe that God is showing up in queer experiences. And if we want to know the God of history, the God of Christian revelation, that's where we need to go as theologians. That's where we need to go as, as a Christian community. I'm thinking the, the mention of the Exodus account reminds me that uh, the the epigraph of each of your par of each of your chapters is a quotation from scripture, a different passage from the Bible. Um, and in one of your chapters, I can't remember which one, forgive me for this, but you you draw from the synoptic parable of the sower as kind of illustrative of the history in the United States of LGBTQ Catholic ministries. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I thought it was a very clever way to use that biblical image. Yeah. So the, the story is the sower who throws out seed very, very liberally, and some of the seed falls places that's rocky ground and it doesn't sprout very well. Some of the seed gets eaten up by birds. Some of the seed, though, falls on good ground and it, it sprouts and it, it flourishes. I see this as being a, a really beautiful image for LGBTQ ministry because God's grace is everywhere. And especially as I was writing this book, I saw God's grace at work in so many different communities and so many different situations and circumstances. Like God is just pouring down God's grace onto the church through LGBTQ people. Uh, and yet in many places, the church hasn't been ready to receive that grace, right? So in some places it has flourished. In some places it's, it's fallen apart. In some places it's died very quickly. Um, but, but my vision and my understanding of God is that the grace keeps coming, right? And that grace is coming now. And that's what gives me hope for the future as an LGBTQ Catholic, that um, it doesn't depend on, on human beings. It doesn't depend on the institutional church, but there's a good God, right? Who's giving and giving and giving through LGBTQ believers. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, one of the things, a theme that I picked up on throughout the book in the stories, the kind of historical marching through the last century, is the, the role of, of ignorance and knowledge. And you mentioned when talking about the sacredness of LGBTQ stories and experiences, um, the sharing of them. You know, the Harvey Milk quote that you, you shared where he talks about, you know, like, we need to come out of the closet to tell the true story, right, so that people can hear it. And I think, you know, one thing I think about with our students generation, Generation Z, a lot of, a lot of folks here is, you know, through social media, through other forms of communication, stories are, are told more kind of readily. And it may be hard to remember, take it from an old, as the kids say, that, you know, the stories weren't as easily accessible, certainly back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so there was one uh, story that you convey um, about a workshop that I believe New Ways Ministry, Sister Janine Gramick in the 70s was offering where um, some LGBTQ folks were telling their stories to uh, lay ministers and ordained ministers and women religious. And, and if I may just quote from um, one of the people at that workshop that you include in this book, um, on page 45, it's a, it's a woman religious, it's a, a Catholic nun who... Uh, reflects on her experience. It looks like in 1984, she attended a workshop and this is what she said. She said, my own very limited knowledge of homosexuality led me to misunderstand much of the problem. It was only because of the injustices perpetrated that I gave any thought to the issue at all. Your own faithfulness to church teaching coupled with the sensitivity to the plight of the homosexuals and the scientific data you presented has helped my own attitudes to open up considerably. I was very moved by that reflection from the early 1980s um, by a woman religious who herself shared that she w she just wasn't paying attention to what was happening, it seems, in the queer community. But then being aware of the the struggle, the, the, the suffering, and yet the persistence in faith was transformative for her. So I guess my question to you is like, what role do you think ignorance or misinformation continues to play in the perception of the LGBTQ community in the Catholic Church? Sure. Uh, I would argue that many of our leaders are intentionally ignorant of the LGBTQ community. Um, they know that we exist. They know that we're here uh, and they refuse to dialogue. They refuse to listen. I, I think of many bishops here in the United States, especially, right? Um, I know I've tried to organize to have a meeting with my own Cardinal Archbishop, uh, but there's not an opening, right, to talk. There's no interest in in listening to grassroots Catholics. 
Um, and I think that allows certain elements of the church to continue to persist, right, in their ignorance, to continue promulgating doctrines that harm people, right? I, I think as a gay man, the description of my sexuality as being intrinsically disordered is a, a prime example of this. Uh, a teaching of a form of theology um, that has very little to do with how I experience my sexuality and, and the graces that God has poured on my life through my sexuality. Um, I think, especially right now, there's a great deal of ignorance about the trans community among our bishops. I see bishop after bishop uh, coming out with anti-trans policies in Catholic schools. Uh, there's talk in the Vatican of a new Vatican document that's going to be, sounds like it's going to be anti-trans. Um, Church leaders describe it as uh, an ideology, right? Gender ideology, which to me clues me in that they haven't really talked to any trans people. They they don't know the situation. They don't know the struggles. They don't know the experiences, uh, the struggles or the graces, quite frankly. Um, and so dialogue is so very key. And, and I think it's really important too for our leaders to, to listen, to take a posture of listening. And this is one grace from Pope Francis's papacy is that he has encouraged the church to listen because I believe this listening will transform the church, right? Um, it will challenge our teaching. It will challenge our understanding, but it'll also challenge us to see where God is at, to see what God is doing um, in the lives of ordinary believers. And I, I think that's what struck me about that religious sister's quote, you know, her, her reflection about how powerful the experience of that workshop was, that that information is transformative. And I think about you know, we're both academics, we're both professors, we have a lot of students and faculty members uh, here in, in, in the auditorium today. Um, and the purpose of education is to be transformed, it is to be enlightened, it is to have our horizons opened, which leads me to something you say at the end of the book, kind of like looking back on this, this historical trajectory, these examples and communities, you say, um, you list four, I think three or four, um, uh, reasons why you think many church leaders building on what you just said in your response to me um, do not come out in support of the LGBTQ community. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I think it applies to church leaders for sure, but I think it applies to kind of, you know, rank and file Catholics, we might say, Catholics, everyday Catholics in the pews, um, as much as it does to anybody else in the church who finds themselves maybe misinformed or willfully ignorant, as you say. So, you know, how do you, in light of all these historical stories, get to this point and say, you know, I think these are some of the reasons why people are refusing to um, to support the community? Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, people are challenged by change, right? Um, I think people are afraid of change. People are afraid that if we uh, evolve in our understanding of sexuality, it will challenge the foundations of our tradition, the foundations of our beliefs. So, uh, it's sort of a slippery slope argument, right? That if our understanding of sexuality changes, we're going to have to reevaluate everything. Uh, and people have so made really an idol out of the church's teaching on sexuality that they can't imagine changing it because they think the whole system will fall down, right? Uh, if it if it is challenged or changed at all. Um, I also think the the church, um, and not just the hierarchy, but uh, has a lot of unhealthy understandings of sexuality. Um, there are a lot of closeted church leaders who can only imagine disintegration, sexual disintegration. They don't know what healthy sexuality looks like. And because they're not talking to uh, healthy LGBTQ people, they sort of project all of their own oftentimes internalized self-loathing onto the LGBTQ community. Um, and they just don't know how to process it. Um, yeah, so those are a few of the the, the, the reasons that that I think there really is a resistance to change. Um, I appreciate that. And, and tying it again to the information and, and disinformation, misinformation, one of the things I often say is something to the same effect of your point about the scariness of, of change, of new information, that learning is always uncomfortable because when you learn something new, you either have to relearn something you thought you knew, which is uncomfortable and vulnerable, or you learn something you didn't know, it unveils your your ignorance. And so a lot of people just don't want to learn. They don't want to hear something that's different or novel. Right. right. And I think as Catholics, when we say that God has given us this tradition, has revealed this tradition, to recognize that the tradition is dynamic and that it changes according to context, according to historical circumstance, is a really scary thing 
to say, right? Where is God? Is that what, what is unchanging about our tradition, right? What's the, the kernel of the gospel, the kerygma that we can hold on to if it, it, our understanding of it evolves over time? So just a little clue to our audience, if you have questions or comments, we're going to have folks uh, with microphones who will see you. So just please uh, raise your hand and they'll come to you. But as you're thinking of what you might like to ask or, or to share um, about Dr. Steidel Jack's uh, book and some of the conversation we've had, I have maybe one more question for you. Um, like every college campus here at St. Mary's and in the tri-campus community of Notre Dame and Holy Cross, we have many students who identify as part of the LGBT community. Do you have any advice for those queer young people who are struggling to reconcile their deep faith, their, their women, their men, their people of deep faith, and yet they want to live uh, their authentic selves, one might say? And, and you, you shared a bit about your own sort of journey. Do you, what advice might you give from your experience? I would encourage you to find supportive LGBTQ Christian community. Uh, queer believers are out there inside the Catholic Church and outside the Catholic Church. Um, Find a LGBTQ supporting, supportive uh, faith, spiritual director, mentor, right? Um, I think that is so, so key. Um, set yourself up for success. Set yourself up to be supported. Set yourself up to be loved. Um, I found an affirming parish in New York City. I was part of an affirming theology department that gave me the theological tools and resources that I needed to integrate my faith and my sexuality. Um, I would also recommend getting a good therapist. Uh, some of these issues go really, really deep uh, and have a lot to say about our family backgrounds, about our faith backgrounds growing up in parishes and uh, the communities that we come from. Um, it's hard work. Sometimes the work takes years. It takes decades to figure out, right? But um, the hope of the Christian is that God is in the midst of it, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our suffering, but also in the midst of our joys and in the midst of our triumphs, right? So don't be afraid of joy either. Don't be afraid to be happy, to latch on to those parts and to celebrate those parts of LGBTQ culture, identity, experience. You know, it's it's really great being a gay man, I can say from my experience, right? Like it's something that I celebrate. Like I, I smile and I thank God that I have a husband when I wake up in the morning. And when I was single, I was, I thank God that I could go out and have a nice night on the town too, right? Um, there are good, beautiful parts of being LGBTQ people. It's not something uh, to be afraid of. It's not something to be ashamed of. Um, we can find God in it. We can, and we do find God in the midst of it. Thank you for that sharing. Um, we'll open up the floor now for um, folks who have questions and we have some microphone runners here. Hi, sorry. Um, I wrote down my question <laughs> if you're wondering why I'm on my phone. Um, so this is similar to what uh, Professor Haran was getting at, but kind of a, on a more like personal level, I guess, is did you have any advice for how to go how to go about opening a conversation about LGBT representation um, like with someone of faith or someone who does not have that experience? Sure. So are, are you talking about sort of someone who's opposed maybe to LGBTQ inclusion? Um, I find it's helpful to go to the heart of the gospel, right? Uh, to talk about Jesus. What was Jesus's ministry like? Um, this is something that I learned from Father Jim Martin. He's talking about Jesus all the time. What is Jesus? Jesus uh, is the author and perfecter of our faith, as the scriptures describe it, right? So uh, for me, he's the model of what our faith should look like. He's the model of what our communities should look like. Um, more recently, I think Pope Francis is a great example. Uh, he's a great conversation starter. Oh, did you see what the Pope did? Inviting a group of trans women, right, to have lunch with him in the Vatican. Did you see what Pope Francis did inviting LGBTQ ministry leaders? Um, why isn't our parish like that? Why are you like that, Father? Um, did you read Fiducia Supplicans, right? Uh, the church is called upon to bless same-sex couples, right, if they present themselves for a blessing. Um, it's there, and it's there, and it's increasingly visible for us today. So I think there's a lot that we can draw on, even in church current events, right, and what Pope Francis is doing, what the Synod is talking about, um, that can be a good conversation starter. 
Firstly, I just wanted to start with just saying thank you for being so open with your story and your research. I think it's just influential, like on behalf of us as students, I'm not part of the LGBTQ plus community, but I do thank you. Um, I did want to ask you during your research if there was um, anything that just caught you by surprise. Yeah, so I was surprised by how early LGBTQ Catholic ministry began. Um, there's sort of this story, this narrative that it begins with LGBTQ liberation, the LGBTQ liberation movement at Stonewall, right? So uh, the early 1970s and, you know, LGBTQ activists are out and proud and marching in the streets. But uh, there's this whole history, decades of history prior to that, uh, that began in the 1940s. And, and for me, if that's not a sign of God's work, I, I don't know what is, right? Um, that there were communities calling the Catholic Church to greater fidelity to the gospel, to welcome and affirm gays and lesbians at a time when even the rest of society wasn't talking about these issues, right? Um, so in a sense, gay and lesbian Catholics were at the forefront of these affirming movements, and they were taking care of people in ways that people needed to be taken care of. At that time, if you were outed as a gay and lesbian or lesbian, you could lose your housing, you were fired from your job, and the Eucharistic Catholic Church gave people work. Uh, it housed people, right, uh, when they got kicked out of their apartments. So a, a Christian, a Catholic community meeting the needs of people where they were coming from. Um, it's a really beautiful history. It's a, a history born out of immense suffering and exclusion, but this is where I, I find God, right, in, in the tale. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, do you think that despite all the recent backlash and hate against queer folks in the church, um, could there be a time in the future in which the Catholic Church might become more welcoming and supportive of LGBTQ plus Catholics? And what can we do as just um, ordinary people or members of like not, not members of the LGBTQ community to help support the change? That's an excellent question. So I, I actually have a lot of hope for the Catholic Church and even the Catholic Church here in the United States, where a lot of our bishops are not on board with LGBTQ affirmation. I find hope at the grassroots level. Um, about 70 percent of Roman Catholics in the United States support same sex marriage, which puts us up right with the mainline liberal Protestants. Right. Uh, Unitarian Universalists aren't too far ahead of us in terms of affirmation in that regard. And change is coming from the grassroots. Um, parents, families don't want to take their children to parishes where they're going to be hearing homophobic, transphobic homilies, right? Uh, parishes with ministries are thriving. Not just LGBTQ people showing up, but allies, friends, right? Family members that want to be a part of affirming Catholic community. And that's really where I see the change happening. It's at the grassroots level. It's, it's in parishes. Um, I don't see it as sort of being imposed from the top down. We've sort of seen how that's worked out recently with fiducia supplicants, you know, the Pope saying that everyone, same-sex couples should be able to receive a blessing from priests. There's been a lot of resistance to it, but when it sort of comes up from the, the bottom, from the grassroots, it's much more natural. Um, and so when you ask, what can we do um, at the local level, if you are involved in your parish, you can ask questions, right? Uh, you can talk to the pastor. Um, oftentimes other ministry groups are helpful springboard. So partnering with young adult ministry, you know, uh, one parish in Chicago had a very vibrant young adult ministry and they figured we must have LGBTQ people here somewhere. And so they began a ministry and started intentionally welcoming people and LGBTQ people showed up. So it's, it's thinking about making connections, networking, um, getting the resources that you might need, right? If this is your calling, if you believe God's moving you to change the church, dive right in. Um, I know a lot of local parishes have started things off by reading Jim Martin's Building a Bridge book, right? Um, this is a helpful starting place just to ask the question, 
who are we as a community? How do LGBTQ people understand us? How can we build stronger relationships? Um, there are a lot of resources there. I think uh, national ministries, getting in touch with national ministries might also be uh, a, another way of going. Um, I mentioned Fortunate Families, New Ways Ministry. These are all groups, Catholic groups, that are doing the work with parishes, with schools, with dioceses to move the conversation forward. Or maybe you'd have, he won't say this, I'm sure, because he's too humble a, a scholar, but maybe a reading group of Dr. Steidel Jack's book. <laughs> you know, just putting that out there. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I had a question about like, so you work in grassroots uh, like movements within the Catholic Church, and I'm curious because the Catholic Church is so clearly hier hierarchical. I'm curious about like how you are able to work within the hierarchy and like the interactions between like the grassroots and the hierarchy and that dynamic. Yeah. So first of all, I'm grounded in my local parish. And that's really, really important to me. If all that I was doing was reading Vatican announcements all day, I'd be out of the church in a heartbeat. It would be really, really hard to remain Catholic. Um, I've described it as a roller coaster. It's up and down, up and down, especially with Pope Francis, right? Um, it's hard to be a Catholic. So I, I make sure that I'm grounded in my local parish. And that gives me a springboard to talk about our collective experiences, to talk about my experiences as a man of faith, as a Catholic, right, uh, who is involved in my community, who does support my parish. Um, so that's the, the first step. Um, I've also been able to build relationships with theolo other theologians, um, church leaders, you know, and, and I have been able to communicate my own thinking, my own thoughts, my own concerns uh, to people who then communicated on to others, right? Um, so I, I am in contact with Father Jim Martin, for example, and he's able to amplify the voices of LGBTQ people like me. Um, and so it's really important to have good allies because without good allies who have connections, um, who are ordained, you know, who are part of the hierarchy themselves, um, I think it, it, it could be really, really challenging to be heard and to be seen. Um, thankfully, I, th I think Pope Francis is trying to challenge, clericalism the church is trying to challenge sort of this attitude that only people in power get heard within the church. He's, he's encouraging church leaders to go to the margins, to listen. The whole synod process is about teaching the church how to listen to people. Um, and I've participated in a lot of synod sessions. Um, I think this is actually another way to get involved. Show up when there's listening sessions in your parish, in your diocese, um, because I think the church is changing. And it's really important, especially for people who are LGBTQ affirming, to be there because our voices do matter, and increasingly the church is, is willing to listen. I have two questions. I think the first one's short, though. What is a, What do you mean by grassroots? Um, sure. Just grassroots, I mean the local level. So... Um, people at the bottom of the church hierarchy, at the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah, not the Pope, not the Vatican, but sort of in your ordinary, everyday Catholic life. Okay, thank you. And then my my like actual question is, why do you think there are still ministries and dioceses that are like sending out hateful messages when one of the main things we teach, from my understanding in Catholicism, is to love everybody? Yeah, um, that's a big question. That's a big question. Um it's a challenging question, and I, I hope it challenges dioceses and church leaders where hate is, you know, the way of operating, um, where there isn't welcome, where there isn't affirmation. Um, yeah, it's sort of the question of the problem of evil, right? And, and how does the church participate in, contribute to evil? I think part of it is culture, part of it is history. Um you know, as a society, we've only been addressing, openly addressing LGBTQ issues for the past half century. Um, the church has a long ways to go in catching up. I think also the church teaching has sort of internalized a lot of harmful attitudes and ways of thinking from the past. Um, so Dr. Haran has spoken in his work about the ways that the church has sort of internalized theological anthropology from the 13th century, for example, and that that needs to change. But I think when it comes to LGBTQ issues, we've also internal, internalized a lot of unhelpful homophobic 
pseudoscience science from the 1950s and 1960s, a uh, time when homosexuality was seen as a pathology, a sickness, right? When Freudism told everybody that the only reason why someone would be gay was because they had a bad relationship with their father and their mother was overbearing and these sorts of things. Like the church really, really internalized these perspectives in the 1950s, 1960s, and made them an official part of church teaching to the point now where if you read the catechism, you see homosexuality described as a condition, right? And where courage, the only church approved apostolate for uh, LGBTQ ministry or gay and lesbian ministry is for those who suffer from same-sex attraction, right? It's seen as a sickness, um, much of the way that psychologists saw homosexuality as a sickness in the 1950s and 1960s. So there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of catching up to do. And, and I think these older, archaic, and, and quite frankly, non-Christian attitudes uh, really have a, an incredible staying power. I think we have time for maybe one more question. As the friend, as the family member, and as the ally, what is the best way to support our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, in your opinion? Love. I mean, it's 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 a, a simple but big word, right? Uh, loving them. Unconditional acceptance. Um, listening is another big word. Paying attention to their stories, right? Believing them. Um, I can't tell you how many times... LGBTQ folks have told me, nobody believes me. Nobody believes me when I say I'm trans. Nobody believes me when I say I'm gay, right? They come up with excuses or justifications or you're just this way for a period. Believe people. Um, amplify LGBTQ stories. That's really, really powerful. Um, talk about your LGBTQ family member or friend in your parish. Talk about them to... Uh, your priest, right? Uh, talk about them within your diocese. Um, I really believe that the closet is the most harmful thing, right? It's a closet of shame. It's a closet that keeps LGBTQ people quiet. And whenever an ally amplifies our story, it's a little bit less work that we have to do, right? It creates a space in a parish, even an unaffirming parish. It says, hey, maybe you want to watch the way you're talking about my LGBTQ person. Maybe those the homophobic, the transphobic jokes aren't okay. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be having the workshop on someone who's teaching that same-sex attracted people are intrinsically disordered, right? Like maybe we should consider this because this is my loved one. This is my friend. It it, it helps put a face uh, on quote unquote ideology, right? It helps put a face uh, on political movements, right? It personalizes it in a way that is incredibly powerful and meaningful in local local context. Well, I know there are a lot more questions. Uh, people seem to eager to in engage Dr. Steidel Jack. Um, he'll be available uh, in the lobby afterwards. Uh, folks want to continue the conversation with him one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I'll also say for those who are present that there are flyers from the publisher of his book um, that are at the door with a discount code. Um, if you'd like to, to buy a copy of the book, um, and we will have that link online for those joining us virtually. Um, just a few short announcements before we wrap up for the uh, evening. First, a, a note of thanks to all of you for joining us here in real life. Uh, I, you're also in real life virtually too, but those who are here in person and those who are here online, um, thanks to uh, Dr. Julia Fetter, the Assistant Director at the Center for the Study of Spirituality, and to Miss Maria Doc, who's been running our tech. Um, I also want to remind folks that Though the Center for the Study of Spirituality is an academic center, we do programs like this and lectures and workshops. We have wonderful partners here at St. Mary's College and the Center for Faith, Action, and Ministry, which houses our campus ministry division, is hosting a continuation of the discussion that began in this program uh, for students, St. Mary's students who are here. As I mentioned at the opening, uh, that there are some desserts there as well. So follow your classmates and our wonderful CFAM team uh, to the cupcakes. Um, 
One last announcement. Our next event here at the CFSS is going to be on April 11th. Um, that's Thursday, April 11th at 7 p.m. in this auditorium. And that's with Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee, who is the 2024 Mataliva lecturer. That will also be available uh, via live stream for those who are here remotely. So please join me in thanking one more time Dr. Steidel Jack for a wonderful presentation.